Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Buenos Aires. Today is November 11, 2020. My name is Leandro Pasarela. I'm a tax lawyer and professor of income taxation at UTDT's Masters of Tax Law program. I'm with Professor Selina Valls. Hello, Selina. Hello, Leandro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UTT Global Tax Talk. We are happy to have a new dialogue. Leandro, could you please remind us which is the purpose of these dialogues? Please? Yes. Uh, following uh, UTDT's motors of academic excellence, pluralism, and equal opportunity, UTDT Global Tax Talks is a platform fostering an interdisciplinary dialogue among tax law professors, economists, and political scientists, faculty members from all continents, as well as global tax policy makers on a single hard tax topic. Based on a common questionnaire, they are sharing their views on the same issues, offering the audience a comprehensive analysis. In its first edition, UTDT Global Tax Talks is covering the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the international tax system. We have a roster of 13 recognized speakers. So far, we have talked with scholars from all around the world at different times of the day, on different days, all thanks to technology that has brought us together while being apart. Last week, we started what I would call the encore of our virtual tour before our season's finale on December 9. Our talks with global tax policy makers from the OECD, the IMF, and the UN. Today, we have the privilege and the pleasure of speaking with Professor Michael King, Deputy Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department at the International Monetary Fund. Michael King is Deputy Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund, where he was previously head of the Tax Policy and Tax Coordination Divisions. He was awarded the Daniel Holland Medal of the National Tax Association in 2018, is Honorary President of the International Institute of Public Finance, and was awarded the Masgrave Prize in 2010. Before joining the fund, he was Professor of Economic at the University of Essex and visiting professor at Kyoto University. He has led technical assistance missions to over 30 countries on a wide range of issues in tax policy and consulted for the World Bank, European Commission, and the private sector. He has served on the board of the National Tax Association in the US and on the editorial board of American economic journals, such as Economic Policy, International Tax and Public Finance, of which he was joint founder, Journal of Public Economy, the Review of Economic Studies, and many other journals. He is co-author of book of the modern BNT, The Taxation of Petroleum and Minerals and Changing Customs, and has published such leading general and field journal as the American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, the Journal of Public Economics, Journal of Development Economics and the National Tax Journal. Professor Quinn King, welcome to the UTT Global Tax Talks. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We are honored to have you with us and look forward to our dialogue. But before starting uh, dialoguing, please let me give a brief introduction on the topic that we are discussing. As everybody knows, almost a year ago, in December 2019, a minuscule life form, a coronavirus, appeared on our human world. Since then, it has silently spread using human beings and their advances in technology as means of transportation. Nowadays, coronavirus is an uninvited guest in our lives, and it seems to like to stay among us. And human beings cannot see it or detect it before its unsettling presence becomes real, once it has already infected human beings, jeopardizing our lives. Governments initially reacted to the virus spread, requesting us or directly requiring us to retreat to our homes, disrupting our normal lives. Borders have been closed, place, planes are being grounded. We cannot move far from our places of residence. And if we do, in many cases, we are required to comply with a preventive quarantine. We live very much as if we were characters in a, of a science fiction book until an effective vaccine is designed to allow us to get back to normal, 
which appears to be the case based on recent news, unfortunately. Or the pandemic fades away naturally, which <laughs> unfortunately seems unlikely. Human beings continues to continue to be pushed to transform our lifestyles, sometimes in ways that may remain after the pandemic ends. This transformation includes the way in which we do business. Social distancing is now the rule and electronic commerce is widespread. Everything is delivered to our doors or screens and this behavior will likely remain once we learn to coexist with the pandemic. If we change with the way we do business, this for sure has tax implications. So far, governments have used tactics and tools already known to them to deal with this pandemic's effects on their country's economies and their long-term results are uncertain. In UTDT Global Tax Talks, we are discussing various tax issues derived from the challenges that COVID-19 poses to human beings' economic relations and how states could deal with them effectively to continue generating revenues to provide the essential services that human beings expect to receive from them. For that purpose, Selena and I have prepared a set of questions that was sent to speakers in anticipation to our dialogues. We don't know their answers yet, but we are collecting their views to have a sum up session on December 9. Before going to our questions, Professor King would like to make a few introductory remarks, which are very pertinent to the topic that we are going to discuss. Professor King, please, the screen is yours. Well, thank you again, Eduardo, Selena, everybody. It's a great, uh, very great pleasure to, to be here once more. Let me um, maybe take uh, just a few minutes uh, to open with some uh, thoughts on the pandemic and how we are kind of thinking about the pandemic at the fund, in particular, obviously, in relation to um, tax issues. So I hope everybody can see the, see the slides. Um, I'll now start to go through them. Um, of course, I have to say, first of all, that... Um, Everything I say are going to, is going to be my views, shouldn't be attributed to the IMF more widely. Um, so in the interest of uh, being very frank, um, take these all as just my, my personal view. So in terms of how one might think about forming policy, tax policy and other policies during the, during the uh, pandemic, um, it's helpful to think in terms of three, I think, phases, three stages of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the pandemic. And the appropriate policy responses in that context. First of all, and that's what's shown on this slide. First of all, there's the kind of immediate um, lockdown uh, containment phase, um, which is the, the, the advice here is essentially to do whatever it takes to uh, keep the economy at least moving along to um, protect people and, and businesses to avoid long-term damage, protect, the, protect everybody from uh, the, the most uh, dramatic uh, harmful impacts. With a bit of a focus, of course, on healthcare spending, business continuity issues, which have been a major concern, I think, for uh, many tax administrations, ministries of finance around the world. Um, then, at some point, there is a notion of a, of a stimulus of bringing the economy back, uh, supporting reopening. Um, in that context, of course, and I'll come on to this in a moment, uh, we have to deal, I think, with unusual uncertainty due to the very nature of the pandemic. And then Finally, eventually we'll reach a recovery slash transformation phase at which we're going to have to think about the enhanced revenue needs that many countries are going to face and also think about whether there are some longer term changes we want to build into our economies and, of course, our tax systems as we move towards a, a, a new, uh, new post-COVID world. Just to say a little bit more about those three stages, of course, it's rather complicated because this is a nice stylized diagram. In, in, in fact, the world is not going to be as, as straightforward as that, uh, no, largely because of the unusual and massive uncertainties we have to cope with. So in the, in the first phase, the immediate phase of dealing with um, containment, as I mentioned, there's the doing whatever it takes element, supporting health priorities, which has some tax implications in terms of various kinds of relief that might want might, might to offer, securing the survival of businesses, um, we're ultimately, of course, the focus is on protecting the, the, the solvent enterprises, supporting transformation, and above all, I think, protecting uh, individuals affected both directly and indirectly as a consequence. 
And in support of that, one of the things that we're doing at the fund, you'll see on the right, is we've issued a whole series of what we call COVID notes that try to provide very quick, actionable advice for countries on how to proceed. There's a whole range of topics there. I've just put on the right the cover for one of them that provides an overview of tax issues, but there are others that may be of interest to this audience on business continuity, administrative issues, customs administration, a whole range of uh, very brief notes trying to uh, guide responses in these unusual, unprecedented circumstances. And of course, we think there are also in this phase some, some things that we should try to avoid doing uh, on the tax side. <clears throat> I think, you know, when we're still worried about transmission, we might want to think uh, that we, it's not necessarily the best uh, idea to remove taxes on tourism or, uh, or on travel. There may be better ways to support those sectors through to, uh, through to solvency and, and recovery than by, than by these kind of uh, by tax measures of this kind, which might prove counterproductive. Um, and I think we would advise too against the risk of um, permanent tax cuts, uh, core tax rate cuts of VAT, corporate tax and so on, uh, or things like expanding tax holidays. Uh, clearly, as I know, the corporate tax is a, is a particular um, interest to this group. Um, in some sense, a corporate tax properly done automatically adjusts to uh, firms that are making losses or have other problems, um, maybe issues to deal with prepayments and so on. But at this point, I think we would we'd caution against these kind of potentially permanent changes that might make uh, some of the things we want to do later on uh, more difficult. Phase two is, the, is a difficult phase. Um, it's the kind of the stimulus phase. And you may remember from the, from the global financial crisis, there was much talk about the three Ts to guide measures in this context. The notion being that measures should be timely, they should be targeted, and they should be temporary. And there are, of course, I think particular issues in applying these principles in the present context. In terms of timeliness, it can be very difficult to know when to switch from containment to support to general stimulus, given, as I mentioned, this uh, great uncertainty. Um, we all know, for example, the risks of second waves and experience there. We have to think through what targeted means uh, and thinking when we want to begin to phase out support to affected sectors and households to essentially avoid uh, unduly supporting insolvent firms uh, into, into, a, into a long future. We have to think about what measures are going to give us the best bang for buck in terms of what economists call multipliers, that is the kind of total effect on economic activity. So we have to think about things like, well, do we want to have, think about some temporary reductions in rates of VAT? Temporary because then knowledge of the future increase would bring forward consumption, uh, boost activity that way. Of course, an alternative to a temporary cut is to pre-announce an increase. So rather than say you're cutting it today for a year, say in a year from now, you're going to be raising the rate, which in many ways should have similar effects. We have to think about depreciation. Uh, allowances, other investment related provisions and how those might stimulate activity. And then we have to think finally on temporariness. When do we end phase two? When do we start to think about um, dealing with some of the overhanging uh, revenue issues and thinking about what kind of tax system we want to enter the post pandemic world with? And so that brings us then to the, to the phase three, which I know we're all in many ways looking forward to the recovery and potentially the transformation stage. And I think there, of course, we know that for many countries, there is going to be an increased need for revenue, uh, given everything that's been uh, spent during, the, during the, uh, the earlier phases. So if we think, for example, well, if we look at the chart on the right, which is from the most recent issue of the, uh, the fiscal monitor uh, that the fund published uh, just a couple of weeks ago, this shows developments in levels of government debt around the world. And you can see that um, things were already going up, things went up during the, during the uh, global financial crisis. And we now have a further increase to over 100% uh, globally, ratios of public debt to GDP. And for the advanced economies, talking about something like 125 GDP, which are levels not seen since the end of the, end of the Second World War. Um, so there are some uh, significant revenue issues out there amplified by the crisis. There were revenue issues, importantly, uh, even before the crisis. If we think about low-income countries, the licks on the slide, um, there was already some uh, estimates of the revenue that was going to be required to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, which you remember are kind of um, 
a globally agreed set of objectives for uh, sustainable um, and high quality life, aiming for 2020. Some of the work we've done at the IMF suggested that meeting those goals by 2030 was going to require in low income countries something like another 15 percentage points of GDP, which is a big number. So there was already an issue how we're going to reach those uh, kind of um, revenue targets or spending targets. And those concerns have been amplified clearly by the, by the crisis. If we think about what are the topics we're going to be dealing with in the, in the when we come to think about more, more, more directly, tangibly about the recovery stage, some are familiar, um, but I've mentioned here some of them that are, I think, going to be rather less familiar. Clearly, we're going to be thinking, I think, in terms of the other crisis that we have going on, which is in terms of the climate. Um, clearly, economists are firmly of the view that a, a core component of the response to it has to be some kind of carbon pricing. And I think we're the fund are thinking about how do we progress this kind of agenda to make carbon pricing more effective, to make to ensure to support countries agreeing a way ahead on this. So we're thinking about things like should there be agreement on a minimum carbon price with countries free to set higher prices if they want. BCA refers to border carbon adjustments, so a little bit like the VAT. Should countries be essentially imposing additional tariffs on imports to the extent that those imports reflect uh, carbon that has not been fully taxed uh, in the exporting country? There's clearly some talk of excess profit taxes, which I think will make us think more about the design of the corporate tax, and I suspect we'll come back to that. Issues of, well, do we need some kind of, in almost kind of um, tailored tax measures to, to, uh, that, that are explicitly phrased and framed as being to support the revenue aspect of the recovery? Do we need some kind of reco COVID recovery contributions, perhaps um, targeted to feel better off? We have issues still around before, I think now perhaps with uh, even more focus on taxation of wealth, capital income taxes, and we have a whole range of issues around digitalization. And I mean by that, not simply the international tax issues, and I think we're going to talk about a bit more, but a whole range of issues affecting domestic taxation, tax policies, what happens to the VAT if we move towards more digital methods, we move towards blockchain perhaps, um, and a whole set of issues around the uh, administration, and some lessons, I think, in the in the uh, the current crisis that, that, for example, administrations that had been further along on a digitalization agenda have coped better with the disruption of activities, processes based on paper and physical interactions than have others. So I think we're going to see more emphasis on those um, aspects of tax administration and tax policy. Finally, just to say a little bit about um, because I know this will be our focus, where, where is international tax in all this agenda? I think one point just to remind ourselves is that certainly work we've done at the fund, and I think since confirmed by others, is that we should bear in mind many of the issues of tax avoidance and tax competition actually matter more for developing countries than for advanced. So if you look, for example, at estimates of revenue foregone as a consequence of profit shifting, certainly, in dollar terms, those are larger amounts for more advanced economies, but relative to tax revenue or relative to GDP, they tend to be rather more, rather larger for low income countries. So I think we need to bear in mind when we think about this international tax agenda that in many respects, it's particularly important for the low income countries, even though it's been largely driven, I think, by, by the G20 and others, uh, it really matters very much for, for them. Second point I'd make, and I think is sort of a, for me, I think a cause for optimism is just to reflect what a historic moment I think we've been living through in the past year or so in terms of international taxation. In the sense that really two of the kind of fundamental norms of international taxation for 100 years have been the notion of a kind of bricks and mortar, a very physical permanent establishment idea, and the idea that we allocate by arm's length pricing, uh, rather than by some kind of formulaic uh, methods. And although, of course, those principles are still there, I think we have certainly seen some recognition that they may not be always and everywhere uh, the best way to go about things. In the pillar one of the uh, discussions under uh, the, the proposals under discussion in the inclusive framework, um, in some sense, are a first step towards taxation rights being given to destination market countries, elements of formula, formula kind of formal apportionment flavor in how we go about things. Um, and pillar two, we kind of <clears throat> uh, 
vary and depart from a, from a, another previous though less explicit norm, which is um, by putting trying to put some limits on the extent of tax competition by some form of minimum taxation. So again, that's something that you know ten five years ago uh, would have been I think really unthinkable, um, but now is become part of our everyday discussion. So I think quite how far we've moved on in the last year or so, as I say, I think is really quite remarkable. Um, and it does open the question uh, that I'll finish this presentation with, which is kind of, well, where is all this headed? Where are we going to end up? Where do we want to end up? Uh, what are the big issues? And I think, um, uh, Leandro and Selena, many of your questions will help us um, get to the heart of that. Oh, I did mean to just, I'm shamelessly giving a plug uh, bit of publicity on the right hand side of the screen to um, this is a book that um, Mike Devereaux, uh, Alan Albach, I and others um, are coming out with, I think, probably in either next month or in January, which looks at some of the issues uh, that we're going to be talking about today um, and talks about a couple of particular proposals for uh, directions of, of change in the international tax framework that I hope I'll maybe be able to touch on in the uh, questions that follow. So. That's it from me by way of opening. So uh, thank you very much. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, it has been very interesting, all, all the views that you uh, have shared with us. And having said that, I think that you have touched base uh, on some on our first question which uh, relates to permanent establishment, okay? As we have been asking previous speakers, uh, the lockdown has not disrupted m &E's activities. Rather, they have adapted rapidly and have continued to operate remotely. During this period, their, their management may have been located in more than one jurisdiction. At the same time, some of their activities in other countries may have been performed without the need of any local presence or any significant one. Home office has become the rule, and many employees and independent contractors have got used to it and may be reluctant to go back to their offices. It may no longer be necessary to travel so often again. Also, some MNEs have, may have decided to reduce their local presence in some jurisdictions. So, with all this context, and assuming that the international tax system continues to be based on the source and residence distinction, should the concept of PE be revisited and redefined? If so, how? And should these changes apply as exceptionally to certain industries or should they become the general rule? What are your views on this? Well, thank you very much. Um, no, I think we start with a, with a key question. For me, I think um, it's clear that the, the notion, there's a recognition that the notion of permanent establishment has to, has to change and it kind of is changing. I think we see that with the... Um, with the new nexus rules under, under pillar one and a general kind of sense that, that things need to be uh, rather different. I guess the issue for me is, well, what would then be a reasonable and um, a sustainable basis for a new kind of approach to, to nexus and establishing taxing rights? And being an economist, for me, what um, the test of whether something's reasonable and sustainable is gonna be whether it makes sense in terms of the underlying economics of what's going on. Um, so if I think about the economics and um, the approach one might take, um, there seem to be kind of two leading candidates for, for approaches to this question. One is the idea of focusing on some notion of a user contribution. The other one is a kind of more general, conceptually distinct movement to um, establishing taxing rights in the destination or, or, market, uh, or market economy. So let me say a little bit about both of those. I think on the, the user contribution, so this is really, you know, to your point, it's really a kind of, to me, a variant of the source argument. It's really saying that, well, you know, we're all like little factories and we're producing this information that has some value. Um, and so on, on that argument, uh, there should be some taxing rights to, to the jurisdi jurisdiction in which we are. Um, I think that does raise the kind of a classic issue of line drawing particularly in a world where, um, you know, in some sense, that, that observation, the notion that, that, that users contribute value is not in itself new. It's been around, I think, you know, people often cite mail order lists and things um, as, as, a, as an example that's been around for hundreds of years, but it's clearly becoming much more pervasive, this notion. Um, to the extent, really, it's hard to, very hard to know, given where technology is going, how we would draw the line between when a, the user is really creating value in some sense, 
concept I will I hope I'll return to later. And when it's really nothing nothing special. And you know, I think increasing a world where you know our refrigerators are sending back information on what we eat and our habits and so on and so forth. It's really very hard, I think, to draw a line to establish where a user contribution, a meaningful user contribution exists and where it where it doesn't. Of course, there's a lot of kind of philosophizing and different, you know, making distinctions between active and passive users and so on and so forth. But it seems to me that that really um, very hard to know how you would uh, distinguish meaningful user contribution from, from other cases. Um, and I guess to, to one of your earlier points, I mean, certainly my inclination is to think it's very hard to have rules that are special for specific industries. And I think we see or activities. I think we see that in the discussion of, of the user contribution idea. And of course, all those problems are even before we start to think about, well, how do we figure out what this value uh, associated with user contribution is? How do we allocate it for tax purposes? So the other that brings me a bit to the other approach, which is more the kind of destination market country idea, which again, we see some, uh, I think, quite strong elements of in, in the current discussion. And so I think the idea, and by what I mean by that is taxation being rooted in where the final, where the consumer is giving some taxing rights to the, to the country of consumption. And I think there are two or two rather different arguments that people might use to support giving taxing rights in the in the destination country. One is a kind of fairness argument. And in a way that goes back again to this, um, to the League of Nations report in 1923, which I'm sure many of you have re read and know about where you may remember they have an example of the oranges grown on the trees in California, where basically they say, well, look, we think about the, these, you know, who, who is who's creating value? Uh, in terms of these oranges, and they say, well, there's the, you know, the people who own the trees, there are the pickers, there's the transporters, and there's also the consumers, because without the consumers, this all has no value. Um, so that kind of brings in the notion that, um, you know, there's, there's some potential taxing rights in the, in the country of consumption, so some uh, value added, but that, I think that brings me to, to, to another reflection, which is, I think, in this whole uh, debate about international taxation, less so now, but, but certainly a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about taxing where value was created. Um, and I think that's always been a problematic idea because it's not at all clear where value is created. We might agree that there's some value created where the, where the oranges are grown, some value where the consumer is, but how we, how we kind of allocate the total value between them. In economics, there's no, there's no single right answer. You can, you can, there's no principled answer to how you split that, that value up. So that becomes, um, I think the fairness thing becomes a slightly problematic uh, issue. And also to me, it's not entirely clear why that's not um, something we take care of through the VAT rather through the corporate tax, but that's something we could maybe uh, come back to. The other, so the second argument, so there's a kind of a fairness argument. Uh, the second argument is kind of an efficiency argument. That is what economists mean by that is, is it's, by efficiency, what I mean is an arrangement that doesn't really distort economic activity too much. That is that's the kind of the um, the kind of ideal of raising money, but not really interfering with with production decisions all that much. And this argument for the destination principle relies on the fact that consumers, by and large, are immobile. I mean, it's not completely true, but let's assume it is. So consumers don't move around. In that case, if you do it properly, routing a routing a um, uh, a tax on the, in the market country, a corporate tax, gets you out potentially of a whole range of problems that we have with the corporate tax. So if I might take a moment, you, you may remember, for example, in, I guess it was 2016, 2017, sorry, there was a lot of talk in the US about adopting a destination-based cash flow tax. So that was a tax that com basically was com combined with a VAT. So you didn't tax exports, you brought imports into tax combined with a, with a labor subsidy. And it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a corporate tax because you're giving a deduction for, for wages, but basically it's, think of it as a VAT combined with a, with a, with a subsidy to labor. Um, now, one of the nice things about that is you don't have problems of transfer pricing or, or other avoidance devices. Why is that? Well, if you think about by analogy with the VAT under a destination-based cash flow tax, there's no point playing around with the price at which you export for a related entity 
because the tax you pay in the exporting country doesn't depend on the price at which you, you sell your exports, like a VAT, the exports are out of tax. What happens when your affiliate imports? Well, like a VAT, there may be some tax on the imports, but there's also going to be an offsetting credit. Uh, so again, the price you, you set for your uh, exports within the group simply doesn't matter. Um, so you get out of, because of ultimately reflecting this destination element, you get out of a whole range of problems about tax avoidance, different argument you get out of problems with, with debt shifting, all, a range of uh, avoidance games simply go away. And by the same token, because you're focused on the immobile consumers, you don't really have issues of tax competition, just as we don't really think there are big problems of tax competition with the VAT, you know, leave aside some kind of border related issues, but more or less, you know, um, Germany doesn't have to worry that much what the rate of VAT is in the UK because there's no real competitive implication for that. So that's why in some sense there is, that's why I think um, uh, in, in a pure efficiency terms, um, it's probably easier to make a case for a destination-based tax on efficiency terms, I'd say maybe than, than on uh, fairness terms. But I think these are some of the ideas that we're going to have to grapple with um, as we go forward. And maybe just a final thought on that, two final thoughts, if I may. Sorry, this answer is rather long. I'll try to be shorter going forward. Um, one is that, uh, in some sense, if we, don't, if we don't succeed in, for example, uh, dealing with tax competition through pillar two or some other way, in a sense, the destination-based cash flow tax is where we end up because we end up with the traditional corporate tax being competed away. What a country is left with? Well, they're left with their VAT and trying to keep taxes on labor as low as possible. What's that? That's basically a destination-based cash flow tax. Um, the other point, which is a bit more technical, maybe I won't go into, um, I'm happy to say more if there are any questions, but what's really important is not so much when we is not so much the destination element as actually the border adjustment element. The border adjustment element is really what gives you these nice neutrality properties. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that, for example, if you had a, a formula apportionment scheme where you allocate by sales, you don't have these nice properties. Um, because, for example, you would still have an incentive if you're a profitable company to sell to an unrelated company in a low tax jurisdiction to get some of the sales allocated to the low tax jurisdiction. So you still have a distortion with that form of destination basing. But the, so the key is really the border adjustment. Um, so border adjustment and destination sort of go hand to hand in terms of uh, creating an efficiency argument. Of course, we have to worry a bit about the kind of interperson equity, where the money goes but probably I should leave it there and come back to that question if there's any interest, but thanks. Yes, uh, no, thank you. Uh, I have a, 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 a two follow-up questions, yeah. if, if I could. Um, when you refer to uh, considering the user contribution to, um, to, to, to define P, uh, would this mean that uh, the corporate tax or income taxes are becoming more uh, behavioral taxes, I mean, that they have to take into account the behavior of, uh, of, of the user uh, that is a, a participant of the, of the economic chain? That yeah, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a good question. I think that is an issue. And I think that comes into this kind of issue of line drawing, where do you, can you meaningfully draw a line between some types of behavior that might create nexus and others that don't? That mm -hmm. does seem to me, um, uh, difficult to do in practice. And I'm not sure I really quite see much of a kind of economic rationale for, for that either. Maybe, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I mean, I think it's very going to be very hard to kind of um, have behavioral tests of that kind in terms of creating nexus, would, my, mm -hmm. would be my sense. And uh, in the other, uh, regarding the destination-based uh, corporate tax, would it be in addition to VAT in countries where they already have VAT or would it be uh, in a substitution? I think that's another good question. I mean, I think clearly, clearly a lot of the interest from the DBS CFT in the US was really to have a, a VAT like element in the tax system without calling it a VAT. I think that was clearly a lot of the, the politics. Um, I think in a way it's, it's an issue for countries to decide. Uh, certainly I would, I would imagine um, both running together, um, 
uh, they each have rather distinct roles. I mean, the DBCFT really is a tax on profits because you're bringing a wage subsidy. Um, but, you know, people might say, I mean, some people say, you know, if you, if you have a VAT, do you need a DBCFT? In one sense, no. But it also comes down to this question of the design of the VAT. I think we think in many countries, the VAT is not a kind of a single rate tax on, on all consumption that we might like. Um, so a practical question would be whether a DBCFT could actually have those properties, could have properties we'd like to have in the VAT, but we haven't had, managed to have politically because we have all kinds of exemptions and interest rates and so on. Um, so I think there certainly would be, a, is gonna be a, an element of, um, uh, um, figuring out what the balance between the two is. And I think if, even though, as we say, part of the DBCFT replicates a VAT, um, it may possibly be a better VAT than we have now, but um, I wouldn't want to go further than that, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. But just to, just to, just to, to think that, you know, the, to, to emphasize the point that it is different from a VAT because you're giving the um, you, because you're allowing this deduction for wages, which means in effect you're giving a subsidy for wages. So often people, and a lot of the re resistance with DBCFT is well, you know, prices are going to go up, prices of imports are going to go up. Um, well, yes, but in 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 a sense that there's going to be an adjustment of wages that matches that. So if you're if this is what the you know the theory says that the prices and wages would move in tandem. Uh, because of because of the uh, you know your your tax and consumption we're giving a subsidy for wages so it has quite a different incidence in that sense. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The the next question is strongly related to the to the first one and your first remarks. So the question is: Is the current international tax system designed to attribute tax jurisdiction among state fairly? so that they can generate tax revenue to deal with, like, to deal with, with situations like the COVID-19 pandemic effectively? Why? If, if this goal is not achieved with the current system, how could it be attained? Which line of policy should be followed to achieve this goal? Well, thanks. Yeah, I think um, I think fairness in international taxation is always a kind of a difficult issue. You know, I think we, you know, we, we don't really, I think, have very clear ideas exactly what we mean by fairness. I think we all use the term, um, but often somewhat loosely. Um, you know, I think we we know that there is some issue, you know, that there are there are rich countries, there are poor countries, and we, we know there is a kind of moral obligation to the rich to help the poor. Quite what that means for corporate tax is not so easy to spell out, it seems to me. So it's a kind of a much bigger issue. Um, of course, there is, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of appeal last few years, less I think now has been made to this idea of taxing where value was created. Um, partly I think as, a, as appealing to some notion of fairness. Um, again, I think that's rather limited in terms of where it takes us. It may tell us that, well, there are some places where value is not created and maybe there shouldn't be taxing rights there, but beyond that, it's not clear where it leads us. Maybe one exception, um, and that's what economists call the idea of location-specific rent. So this is where natural resources are the obvious example. This is where a country has some kind of asset um, which has value that generates rents. Rents, by, by mean by that sort of payments in excess of the minimum investors required, so kind of a, an excess profit in some sense. And I think there is a general sense that when there are assets of this kind that have a very clear location um, and generate uh, potentially generate some rents, then the country in which those assets are located should kind of have first rights to, to tax the, the associated rents. And I think we see that as kind of generally accepted, I think, in relation to the natural resources, the whole kind of idea that, um, you know, immovable property, you tax uh, where the property is. <clears throat> But that's a kind of, so that's one exception where I think there's fairly clear uh, what, we th what we tend to think might be a fair allocation of, of resources. Um, beyond that, I think there's not a whole lot one can say. Um, so maybe I'll just mention one other um, recent development that I think is quite interesting, and it comes out of, um, it's, in, it's in pillar one um, of the OECD proposals. We also talk about it, um, uh, schemes of this kind at some length in the book, the Michael Devereux book uh, that I mentioned uh, in my presentation. And that's this idea of distinguishing between routine profits, 
which are a kind of basic return on activities and functions and the idea that these routine returns should be taxed where they where the activities functions take place and then over and above that some kind of residual profit that we then try and allocate across countries by some kind of formula may depend on sales or uh, tangible assets or payroll or employees or whatever um, i think that's quite an interesting idea um, maybe gets towards some of these notions of, of, uh, of, of fairness. Um, of course, for, I think for an economist, they're then slightly, still slightly puzzling ideas because the, these are ideas that come out, I think it's fair to say, of the kind of um, uh, legal practitioner community more than economists. So we would like to think that the routine return is close to being the same as a normal return. That is a kind of a, the minimum, the minimum uh, required return on some investment. And that would then leave the residual as being what I was just describing as rents, payments above the minimum required. Um, so that I think is quite a potentially quite an interesting way of approaching uh, notions of, of fairness, uh, getting I think captures some ideas of fairness. Um, economists I think are a little bit puzzled because in, in practice routine returns I think are defined rather differently from what we would call a normal return. Uh, Routine returns, people seem to generally think of as the kind of return that would be earned in some business that was a kind of outsourced to conduct some particular activity or function, which is a bit different. So, so I think I'm saying there are some kind of conceptual issues that uh, I think economists are trying to grapple with in understanding these schemes. Uh, but nonetheless, I think these, these notions of residual and, and uh, routine re returns may help us um, to some extent grapple with some of these issues of, uh, of fairness. And that's that's me on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before going to the third one, do you think that uh, the global tax system can be remade to serve the global economic pyramid? Uh, when you say the pyramid, what do you what do you have in mind? I mean, the, the poorer of oh. the uh, Yes, I mean, I think we're very conscious of, um, uh, as I was mentioning in the presentation, that um, many of these issues of tax avoidance, tax competition actually matter more for low income countries, partly because they're more reliant on the corporate tax. Um, they have, you know, I think when we think about low income countries, they also have kind of fewer alternatives in a way to the corporate tax. Many of these countries, you know, the VAT is under a lot of pressure, perhaps. Uh, income taxes aren't that well developed. So I think we would certainly see the, a strong international corporate tax as important for, um, for the low income developing countries. Um, that said, uh, it's only really a part of the problem for, for these countries that, um, as we may say a bit more about um, uh, later, you know, I think um, fixing the corporate tax is not going to fix the revenue problems or the revenue needs of, of low income countries. Uh, the answer is sadly are going to have to lie elsewhere. But um, I think we can certainly do uh, devise corporate taxes systems that are more supportive of uh, growth of growth and development objectives of low income countries. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let's move to our third question, which still is around the, the, the topic of uh, source and residence is whether this pandemic is an opportunity to shift the current international tax system to set aside the source and residence concepts in that case, which should the substitutes be? And why, why would they be the, the substitute? And uh, of course, what is the role of digital services taxes in this shift? Thanks. Well, I think maybe on the, um, on the notions of source and residence and alternatives in a way, I think I touched on a lot of uh, what I'd have to say on that um, in answer to the first question. Um, on the digital service taxes, um, you know, I think um, we certainly, th it's clear, I think, that um, there's great merit in, in a multilateral approach here. Uh, you know, I think one has to worry a little bit about some of the trade tensions that can emerge. But nonetheless, you know, I think we, we recognize that there are, there, is a, there are pressures in this direction. Um, uh, <clears throat> but again, I think we're, we're um, hopeful that multilateralism can, can uh, provide us, a, help us navigate through um, this uh, this territory at the moment, but I think maybe I would raise just one uh, thought, perhaps for one kind of interesting idea. I think just for 
uh, to see if people have have reactions, which is um, not without necessarily you know advocating, which is this idea, which is kind of a different rationale for digital service taxes that some people have been talking about, and this kind of starts with the idea, you know, so it's a people often say, well, you know, data is the new oil, data is you know like a wonderful natural resource. Well, if that's true. Um, makes you think, well, shouldn't we be taxing information as we tax oil or other natural resources? And, you know, I think the, the, and the analogy isn't quite right. The analogy isn't quite exact between information and oil because, you know, if I use up some oil, you can't use the same oil. But if I have some information, you can technically have the same information. So the, um, the, the analogy is not exact. Um, nonetheless, I mean, I think people make an argument that says, well, you know, if you think about the information about a country's citizens as like uh, oil under the ground, as like a natural resource. And the individuals themselves can't actually charge for the use of this resource, information about themselves or their behavior. Uh, so maybe the government should do that for them. And how would you do that? Well, again, you think about the oil analogy. And typically what people like us at the fund would say is, well, the ideal thing is to identify the kind of um, the rents, the kind of excess return that is associated with the use of this oil and have a tax on that. Um, so when we advise, you know, um, natural resource country, we often focus on designing kind of taxes that capture some of the rents that arise, from, you know, when prices of oil and so on are, are very high. Um, well, um, that's, of course, difficult to do in the information context. Really, we don't know quite how to do it. But it's also true in the natural resource context that sometimes we don't really know or we have problems implementing rent taxes in many countries, maybe because there are capacity issues or other, other things that make taxing rents difficult. And what do we say then? Well, typically what people say is, well, you should have a royalty. You should have some kind of tax on the value of the, uh, of the output. And what is a royalty in the context of information? Well, it looks very much like a kind of a turnover DST type. DST type tax. So, you know, again, I'm not, I'm really just throwing this out more as being an interesting argument uh, than, than, than advocating it. Clearly, there's, there are problems. We know, for example, that royalties are distorting. Royalties can be very distorting. And I think we have to worry about the distorting aspects of DSTs, in, in, not least in terms of innovation and so on. Um, but I wanted to get that argument out there as one that I think is quite interesting. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting, but I think that there, uh, there might be a difference between oil and, and information because oil, I, I, I might say that it is all useful. Information, there may be some unuseful information, useless information. So you have yeah. to sift through it to, to find the, the... It's true, but it's also true that, um, you know, when natural resources, uh, it's clear that it, it's certainly true the kind of information in itself doesn't have much value. You have to apply the algorithms and all this kind of thing. To, but it's, it's also true that when um, oil and stuff and natural resources have to be processed and so on to have value. Mm -hmm. I always remember doing a, one of, I remember doing um, uh, some work in a country on on the taxation of gold. Naturally, extracting this country was extracting a lot of gold, and you know I, I always imagined gold kind of came out of the ground like as beautiful jewelry. Or whatever but in fact it comes out as this kind of stuff that you then have to process so i think there's you know i think you know either side you have to do some processing and that you know and to use the phrase i don't like adds, adds value but um, yeah mm -hmm. no, I, I, again it's not it's not a perfect analogy but it, it sort of makes you think a little bit yeah. yep thank you thank you very much so now we can we can move to a specific question about corporate taxation. As you know, the pandemic af uh, affected the multinational intercompany transactions comparability. So the question is, what has the pandemic and recent events more generally thought us about how to go about taxing corporations? What do you think about? No, thanks, thanks, Elena. Um, <clears throat> I think probably there are two 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 things that um, that have been interesting. Uh, one, I think, is as I mentioned before, that um, we've been focused. We're beginning to focus on tax competition. Pillar two, I think, is you know, starting to um, address tax competition in terms of if you think simply of revenue impact, 
um, you know, the, the impact of a few point reduction in the corporate tax rate across the world is, is clearly comparable to any estimates of the um, revenue losses from tax avoidance. But the other, the other sort of thing I think that we may have lost a little bit in the, in the debate over the last few years is we've been very focused on these international issues, aspects of corporate tax. And so sometimes I think that we've lost track a bit of some of the more basic issues in terms of the, uh, the design of the corporate tax. The kind of thing I have in mind is, um, is the treatment of debt. Um, clearly there's been some, a lot of work on that in the context of BEPS, but it still seems to me that um, you know, we, we still recognize, we still have tax systems that give companies uh, very large incentives to take on more debt than they otherwise would. And I'm talking here mainly about third party debt, not kind of debt as a, as a, as a debt shifting, as a kind of avoidance device. And we do know that matters for, for things like financial stability. Um, we do know, for example, that um, taxes do affect how leveraged banks are, does affect their financial their stability. Um, and those are issues that um, I think are, are gonna be increasingly important uh, as we look at debt levels around the world, but we're not really focused on that. Every time a crisis comes up, we start to think about dealing with this, this um, the financial stability implications of this uh, encouragement to use debt finance, but we never really do anything about it. Uh, and I think that's also been true in, in the current, uh, over the last few years that we've sort of um, not really focused on some of these design issues. Issues too about, you know, how do we, um, what is the best way of treating investment, the cash flow versus other versus other approaches. And the thing that kind of always reminds you that these issues are still there is that most discussions of the corporate tax always end up with saying, well, why do we have the corporate tax at all? What is the what is the purpose of the corporate tax? Why are we doing it? It came up, you know, already today, for example, in Leandro's question, which is, well, you know, do you need to have a VAT and a and a corp and a DBCFT as well? Um, so I think all these these kind of deeper issues we've we've rather um, uh, not really focused on as much in the in the last few years as we should uh, should have, and perhaps we'll get back to those in the in the nearer future. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we are moving now from uh, the corporate tax to more uh, individual taxes, okay? And uh, what we have seen in the last few months is that many countries are discussing the convenience of levying a wealth tax to collect revenues to afford the economic strains created by the, by the pandemic. Would such a tax be a solution or could it create more problems in the future? For instance, if developed countries start levying uh, wealth taxes, would this imply a decrease uh, in uh, revenue collection for developing countries? Because many wealthy individuals from developing countries <clears throat> have their investments in developed countries for a, a variety of reasons, respect of rule of law and more uh, uh, protection of, of the property, et cetera, uh, or better returns, whatever. Uh, what, what are your views on, 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 on this matter? Thanks. Well, I think on this one, I, um, uh, I very much agree, I think, with the, with the remarks that, uh, that David Bradbury, I think, made in, the, in your last uh, webinar. So maybe I won't um, go into too much detail on that, but I think, you know, the I think he raised the, the kind of the key question, which is, well, you know, there are similarities between a tax on wealth and a tax on capital income. Um, you know, in, the simple, in a simple world, they're basically equivalent things, that taxing the return on something is equivalent to taxing the thing itself. Um, so I think as David very eloquently uh, argued, the first thing I think really is to think about the instruments we already have, the taxes on capital income, things like capital gains tax, and to try to, if we're serious about this, to try to make those more if, work more effectively, uh, rather than necessarily leap into to creating some some new tax that will have its own problems, which he, I think, very eloquently, very persuasively described the other day. Um, so I think we have to look first at our existing instruments to think too through about. Um, uh, some of the administrative measures, high tax wealth payer units and so on and so forth. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I suppose one might worry a little bit that focusing on a new tax 
can almost distract from making proper use of the instruments we already have. Um, and you know, if there are things that make us not use existing instruments well, um, it's not terribly obvious why those same things wouldn't may help, uh, wouldn't interfere with making a, a wealth tax work well. Um, so I think there are, there's a case for looking um, at what we have already, trying to make that work. And I think there I would sort of add in many countries inheritance and gift taxes, where I think um, clearly one can make quite a strong argument on intergenerational equity grounds, so perhaps there's more to be done then. But again, I think it fits in with, uh, with the general theme of, uh, of making best use first of opium and of what we um, what we already have and of course in the US where this issue does you know does come up very prominently um, we know for example there are constitutional issues with with the wealth tax which would which um, I'm sure that lawyers on the call can explain better than me but um, that certainly looks like that might um, tie things up in the courts for, for quite a while um, but I think you know when we when we think about wealth tax again <clears throat> Related, I think, does come back to this issue of, well, what is the corporate tax for? I mean, the corporate tax is partly to tax these um, uh, rents to, to, to presumably accrue, well, do accrue mainly to higher income individuals. So again, maybe there are things one could do in that spirit or through that instrument of, uh, of targeting the, um, the corporate tax more effectively on, on rents as partly achieving some of the things that a wealth tax might be designed to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the next question is, if the government were to, to introduce such measures, how do you think taxpayers would react in general to any potential tax increases resulting from this pandemic? How could their government's approach to deal with this pandemic have any implications in terms of tax reform and taxpayer willingness to accept a tax hike? What do you think about well, that's a very big question. I think clearly the, the context um, of this discussion has really been, I think, the very uneven impact of the crisis. Uh, we know that it has particularly impacted the, you know, the, the poorer, uh, the young, uh, women, some racial groups. So we know the impact has been very uneven. Um, and indeed, some people have probably done pretty well out of the, out of the pandemic. Um, so of course, some of that, you know, the hardships have been alleviated to some degree by public support and so on. But nonetheless, it seems to me that we're going to be coming out of the pandemic with a lot of um, pre-existing inequalities and concerns amplified. Um, and we know some work by colleagues at the fund suggests that in the past experience with pandemics has been that inequality tends to increase uh, as a consequence of the pandemics. So I think, you know, in a way, we are going to have to um, think about um, these kind of renewed concerns of fairness between individuals as we come out of the of the crisis and I think that's the, the it's always important that people perceive what the government is doing as fair that may be particularly the case uh, in this context and you know I think what kind of is interesting there is if you think about how other countries have responded to various natural disasters or to kind of major national events or to wars um, you know they have taken some particular tax measures some have had what what it's sometimes called a solidarity surcharge, um, kind of an additional uh, specific uh, tax levy um, uh, to help finance whatever the special need was. So, you know, Germany had such a solidarity surcharge to help pay for the cost of reunification. Uh, Japan had one to uh, help meet costs of uh, an earthquake. Um, so there, there are some sort of interesting uh, experiences out there that I think we can draw on to ha on how countries have responded to these uh, exceptional needs through various temporary taxes that might be particularly addressed to through you know as add-ons to the income tax or whatever uh, to to try to uh, build in some notion of uh, fairness. So you know one can think of the um, <clears throat> of contributions perhaps to to the to, to recovery from COVID, COVID perhaps in in a similar spirit. Um, and of course the other thing if you look at um, um, uh, wartime and similar experience has been the uh, experience with excess profit taxes. Uh, which um, I'm sure uh, Ruth Navillona talked about, which is, we, we were very widely used, almost universally used during the First and Second World Wars. And if you look at their structure, have very strong similarities to some of the kinds of corporate tax reforms that, that um, might fit into the kind of um, 
debate I was mentioning a moment ago in terms of dealing with things like debt buyers. So there are things like this allowance for corporate equity scheme, where you essentially give companies a kind of a, a, a deduction equal to a, a normal return on capital and tax the rest. Um, that's kind of the nature of excess profit taxes. It's also been, uh, as I say, very similar to structures of, of, of forms of corporate tax that many people would recommend anyway. So I think there are you know, some, uh, in terms of uh, how governments handle things after the crisis, I think that is clearly important. You know, it's always important, but especially important perhaps now to think about ensuring that people find everything fair, and we can look at some historical experiences to how how that can be how that can be done. Um, I suppose another, you know, there's another element of all this which maybe is worth mentioning is of course some people I mentioned carbon pricing and dealing with climate, and I think there are. There is a school of thought which says that, well, as we emerge from the pandemic, people are going to be more attuned to the idea that, you know, the world can throw up these real uh, disasters that affect us all. Um, and climate change potentially has these kind of risks and impact. And so maybe there'll be a greater openness to, to carbon pricing and, and related measures as we move forward. I think that remains to be seen. But um, uh, to your question of how taxpayers may react, maybe that's going to be another area in which we may see some change relative to the pre-COVID world. Thank you. Well, we are reaching our, the, the end of our questionnaire. There might be some question from the audience afterwards. Uh, but what we have seen so far, Professor Kim, is that policy makers are thinking out of the box at this time from your our interview or our dialogue with you and with David Bradbury last week to find new collaborator, collaborative solutions to help the vulnerable, okay? Uh, the question now that uh, we see or we have is, do poorer countries have a claim to receive tax revenues from richer countries to help them cope with crises like COVID-19? In that case, would they be imposed some obligations to receive such assistance in return uh, in, in, in some. Should there be tax transfers from rich countries to poor countries? Thank you. Yes, no, I, well, I think that's, uh, I think th these are issues that I think go far beyond the, uh, the tax world in terms of um, kind of inter-country support and country fairness. Um, and I think I kind of go back to the, to the thought uh, that I mentioned in, in the presentation that, you know, even before the crisis, the, the pandemic, we already had these uh, large revenue needs for many low-income countries to meet um, what the world has, has agreed as, uh, as ambitions in terms of sustainable development goals. Um, I mentioned this estimate of 15 points of GDP for many low-income countries, and it's fairly clear, I think, they're not going to be able to raise that money on their own. There is going to have to be some kind of a little bit more um, creativity, imagination on the financing. Um, so I think that that issue is, is, was kind of there even before the, the, before, the, um, before the pandemic. But I suppose maybe just as we're drawing on, I'd make just a couple of points in that context. Uh, one is... It's always, I think, going to be the case that um, uh, countries' um, ultimate most reliable and sustainable source of revenue is going to come from their own resources, from, from domestic revenue sources. And I think that's certainly what we at the fund put a lot of our work into, is helping countries develop more effective, more um, productive <clears throat> revenue systems, both policy and administration. And, you know, I think that's... The reflection there is that, you know, the last few years, it's been very kind of interesting and exciting to talk about international taxation. And as I say, that does matter a lot for low income countries. But ultimately, that's not going to be the source of that's not going to solve their, their problems. And so a lot of work has to go into the kind of, you know, much more kind of dull and bread and butter work of, you know, fixing the VAT, making sure the VAT works properly, making sure the customs administration works, all these kind of very unspectacular Things that are not as dramatic or exciting as talking about international taxation, but for development purposes in many countries um, matter um, probably rather more. And I mean, the last maybe uh, I hope optimistic point is um, you know again something David Bradbury emphasised is that when you think about tax systems, at least within countries, 
we know that most of the redistribution happens on the on the spending side. Uh, the taxes are there largely to finance very progressive or hopefully quite progressive spending policies. And I think the, the good news there is that from the pandemic, I think we've seen quite remarkable innovation and creativity in many countries in, in developing forms of social support that are kind of effective and reach a, a wider group than, than before, than was even thought possible before. So I think the good news uh, on that side from the pandemic has been this um, progress that's been made in thinking about and developing more effective systems of social support on the spending side. And that, of course, I think um, in, in itself also lends some uh, support for tax systems, given that uh, they seem to be financing uh, effective uh, social spending measures. But sorry, we've overrun a little bit, but I'll shut up. That's fine. Thank you, Professor. We have um, some question of our, from our audience. And we would like to know if, if, if you would like to, to proceed with the question. Sure. Or not. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is some question about the wealth tax that I think that it, it was previously covered with your presentation. Then we have a other question. Uh, it says, what could be the central implication of the rise of China as the new global superpower in the core structure of the international tax regime. Okay, well, I think um, maybe just to say a bit on the, on the, the first question on on wealth. I mean, I think yeah, there is there is a coordination issue. I mean, I do think uh, <clears throat> I do think again, there's been quite um, quite remarkable progress on the um, uh, the exchange of information. Again, I think David Bradbury talked about that. I, I think you know that's. Um, that again has progressed more than I think one could have imagined just a, just a few years ago. Uh, and I think we're probably at the stage of finding out how, how kind of effective that is going to be uh, in terms of maybe supporting not necessarily just wealth taxes, but you know, if we talked about more effective capital income taxes before, I mean, they have a clear inter international dimension as well. So I think we're at the point of seeing, well, is, is automatic exchange of information really going to help uh, if countries want to move uh, in somewhat different directions, perhaps on taxing capital income? I think on, on China, I think I, I wouldn't have a whole lot to say, except to note, of course, there are, you know, in many respects, um, there are potentially some similarities between China and the US, I think, in terms of some of their the, the, the interests and their, um, uh, you know, the role of digital companies and so on. Uh, but I think further than that, I'm probably not going to speculate right now, but it's an a interesting question. Well, thank you very much. I think that we are... Uh reaching the end of our 12th talk uh, and uh, next week and there will be uh, a talk because we are going to have a break uh, because uh, currently we have two conference two conferences two professional conferences going on uh, the international bar association conference is uh, uh, virtually happening right now as we speak and next in the next two weeks we are going to have uh, the IFA Congress virtual as well, so um, so as not to conflict with these uh, uh, <clears throat> meetings, we are going to resume our talks on December second with Professor Michael Leonard from the UN, uh, and this would be our last UTTT Global Tax Talk before our sum up session on December 9th. Having said that, Professor King. We have uh, to thank you very much. We are very grateful for your participation, for your contribution. It has been very interesting to speak with you and hopefully we remain in touch. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye Selena. Bye. See thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.